Uh, good morning. My name is Bakhtiar Tuzmukhamedov, uh, and I'm proud to be affiliated uh, with both institutions uh, which cooperated in putting together uh, this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, I'm member of the advisory board of the uh, International and Comparative Law Research Center, and I'm also proud to have been recently elected to the Council of the International Institute of Humanitarian Law. It's good to see friends, uh, old and new, uh, but most with very long history. Uh, thank you all for responding to our call to arms uh, on such a short notice. Uh, while I should leave to uh, leadership of uh, the two institutions whom I will uh, shortly introduce, um, um, who will present uh, the concept of this uh, workshop and rationale behind it, um, an expected outcome. I, I'd rather look at this gathering as uh, author's uh, conference. Uh, Dieter Fleck, a friend of uh, almost 25 years, is a master of this uh, method. Um, several authoritative uh, and internationally renowned uh, publications which Dieter uh, edited, including the Handbook of the Law of Visiting Forces, uh, the Handbook of uh, International Humanitarian Law, the Handbook uh, of uh, International uh, law uh, of military operations, such uh, authors' uh, gatherings. Uh, while uh, we do not uh, entertain, although maybe we should entertain the thought of going straight to Oxford University Press or Cambridge University Press, um, with an offer, I believe that the center, uh, which is uh, which is co-organizing this event, um, um, uh, has capacity to arrange a publication that could uh, be then offered to law libraries, uh, um, law schools, and um, other interested parties. Uh, please entertain this uh, thought um, as we um, exchange ideas uh, throughout this day. With that, allow me to introduce uh, you to leaders of the two uh, co-organizers of um, this workshop. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, um, Lieutenant General, my apologies. Um, uh, I no, no, no. I, uh, I was impressed. I was impressed by the uniform, the only uniform that we have here. Lieutenant Colonel, that's why. I was looking at you, Giorgio, but I was uh, thinking about Lieutenant Colonel uh, here. So uh, Lieutenant General Giorgio Battisti uh, retired uh, in um, 2016 um, um, from position of uh, commander of Italian Army Training and Doctrine Command. Um, after 44 years of distinguished service in the Italian Army. He served in command and leadership positions from platoon through corps and army command, including the cadets regiment uh, at the military academy, the uh, Taurinese Alpini Brigade, uh, which is very much local here, um, and the NATO Rapid Deployable Corps, uh, Italy. Uh, throughout his career, General Battisti held multiple command and staff positions in international coalition operations. In particular, he was assigned to the UN mission to Somalia. Uh, Georgia, I believe it was Onisom II, right? Uh, and the uh, NATO led S4 uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, furthermore, he served um, four tours in Afghanistan, the first one being in 2001, 2002. Uh, uh, during his uh, last combat deployment to Afghanistan in 2013-2014, General Battisti served as Chief of Staff at ISAF headquarters in Kabul. A month ago, almost to a day, uh, Giorgio Battisti was elected Vice President uh, of the Council of the International Institute of Humanitarian Law. Ms. Victoria Mankov has uh, served as the general director of the uh, International and Comparative uh, Law Research uh, Center since uh, 2018. She joined uh, the center as an expert in uh, public international law, later becoming the assistant to the then uh, director general. Uh, prior to that, she practiced international law uh, in uh, reputable uh, firms, including Brian Cave, Leighton Paisner, providing legal support to major Russian and international corporate clients. Um, Victoria's international experience includes um, investor state dispute settlement reform currently underway uh, under the guidance of uh, uh, Yun Sutral. She has been most instrumental in putting together several major events hosted by the center that she leads now. 
including a workshop on evidence uh, before international courts and tribunals that brought together uh, active and retired international judges, um, senior staff members from several international jurisdictions, as well as attorneys admitted to practice before them, some present here today. Uh, Victoria read law at uh, the most uh, reputable uh, schools, uh, Natalia, no offense taken, with respect to your school, uh, St. Petersburg uh, and uh, Moscow State Universities from uh, which she received a bachelor's and master's degrees in international law, respectively. With that, I would like to invite General Battisti to offer a few remarks. No slide at the moment. Good morning again, again, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished expert, dear participant, good morning. Dobri din, that's correct? <laughs> On behalf of the, of the president of the institute, this uh, new president, Professor Eduardo Greppi from the Scuola di Applicazione di Torino, where there, we have one officer coming from uh, Turin, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you all to San Remo, the city of flowers. On the occasion of the workshop regarding the application of international humanitarian law and international human rights law in armed conflict. It's for me a great honor to be part of this outstanding parterre. First of all, let me briefly spend a few words on the Institute on the, and its history. As you probably know, the Institute is a, an independent, non-profit organization founded in Sanremo in 1970 with the main objective of promoting and teaching international humanitarian law and the human rights through the organization of training programs, research initiatives, seminars, workshops like today, and roundtables. More than 14,000 people coming from the different regions of the world have taken part in these various activities of the Institute. This combination of factors has created through the years a unique multinational environment, which is uh, universally known as the spirit of Sanremo, lo spirito di Sanremo. But coming back to the workshop, uh, the today topic is very stimulating, since human rights are an intrinsic, intrinsic part of the legal rules governing conflict and other emergency situations. In this regard, the interaction between the international humanitarian law the international human rights law in armed conflict is one of the responses of our time to the dynamic of war and, of course, of the law. In my opinion, as a seasoned soldier, this is a very important topic because, at the end of the day, the last element of this long process are the soldiers and commanders in the field who have to correctly apply the guidelines standing operation, operating procedures and directive. These norms, in my experience, must be understandable and applicable for them. So must be very simple and clear, offering guidance on how to interpret and apply the various convention to military operation. It is not so simple because soldiers, 18, 19, 20 year soldiers, must decide in a very few seconds if he has to shot or not to shot or, or to speak with the, the opponent. In the last 25 years, the international scenario has profoundly transformed. The nature of armed conflict has deeply changed. And the concept of war and peace have become blurred by the changing characteristic of warfare. Armed conflict, both international and non-international, are still a reality, unfortunately. And the issue of the enforcement of the international humanitarian law and the respect of human, human rights and the human values has acquired a fundamental importance in the international agenda. While the international humanitarian law and the international human rights law vary in terms of origin and situation, in which they are applied, the two bodies or, rule or rules have the same objective in order to achieve the greatest possible protection of individuals in all circumstances, especially during wartime. 
there is a growing awareness of what is right and wrong in the context of armed conflict. And nowadays, it can only be identified by reference to both international humanitarian law and international human rights law. But before closing my speech, following previous contact with the Professor Pokar, that was the, the former president of the Institute, I would like to announce the intention to establish an even closer relationship between our two institutes, consider their similar purposes to promote development and continuous dialogue on the complex and evolving subject of the rules of law that are an essential pillar of any modern military operation. We, at the Institute, are at your disposal to help and assist you so that your stay here in the City of Flowers will be as pleasant as possible. So I wish you all a pleasant and fruitful stay in San Remo. Spasiba Bam Balshoyan. Grazie, General Battisti. I, and I especially, special thanks uh, go out for mentioning uh, the name of uh, Fausto Pacar, who is a good friend of uh, many of us here, and who indeed was most responsive to uh, uh, an approach uh, to uh, hold this uh, uh, meeting in cooperation. Uh, Victoria Monco, please. Um. Good morning, dear colleagues. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Judge Tuzmohamedov and Mr. Batisti for the kind, General Batisti, sorry, for the kind uh, introduction of the event. And uh, I want to welcome all of you here. And uh, now I want to say some words about uh, our center. Uh, International Comparative Law Research Center is a non-profit, non-governmental organization that conducts research on various, various issues of international law and comparative law. It takes part in uh, the work of UNCITRAL as an observer since uh, this summer. The center implements educational projects aimed to promote the study of international law, organize the annual award for the young international lawyers, and the summer school on public international law. We hold workshops and conferences on relevant topics, and uh, these topics is also very important for our center. And uh, turning to uh, workshop, uh, we, th we think that uh, uh, this workshop indeed addresses a very interesting and relevant issue. And I'm very glad that uh, it has eventually uh, come to reality. I believe that uh, everyone looks uh, forward to a productive discussion of the complicated topic. And I'm very glad that uh, we have experts from different parts of uh, uh, the world which has, which, uh, with a great experience in this sphere. On behalf of the International Comparative Law Research Center, we would like to thank and uh, uh, express our deepest appreciation to the uh, Institute, International Institute of Humanitarian Law for their support in organizing of uh, this event. And uh, we are very glad to continue relationship with, with uh, the Institute. Uh, we also express our appreciation to the experts uh, who have found time in their busy schedule to take part in this event and share their professional uh, opinion on this topic, and also the, uh, all the guests here today in San Rema, and uh, uh, those who are watching us uh, online. And uh, without further ado, I would like to suggest to move uh, to the first panel of our event, and now I give the floor uh, Judge Tuzmohamedov to introduce uh, the, first moderate, the moderator of the first panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. Um, uh, Professor Natalia Sokolova uh, has been um, head of chair of international law at the Moscow State Law University since 2017. Uh, she graduated with honors uh, from the law school of Irkutsk, uh, Irkutsk Univers University in 1993. Most of you have heard about Lake Baikal, so Irkutsk is very close to it. So it draws a lot of force from that, from that uh, world famous lake. Uh, since uh, 2004, she has been a professor of international law uh, 
at the department she now leads. Courses that she teaches include uh, the general course of international law, international humanitarian law, international uh, human rights law, and international environmental law, the latter with a specific emphasis on uh, protection of environment from uh, uh, hostile effects of armed conflict. Apart from being a well-published author, Natalia is um, a member of the Council of Competition International Law in 21st Century, which is organized and administered by the International and Comparative Law Center. She has been a regular contributor to uh, Biennial International Conference Martin's Readings on Contemporary Issues of International Humanitarian Law, which some of you have uh, attended as panelists, uh, uh, some of you even more than once. Uh, Natalia, you take the lead. Bring your troops with you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Dear colleagues, I would like to invite you. Dear colleagues, dear colleagues, good morning. Okay, uh, I'm repeat if you don't mind. My name is Natalia Sekalova, and I'm charge in charge for this panel today. And how the, I do hope our honourable experts will share this responsibility with me. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to deep gratitude to the organizers of this uh, uh, event for the opportunity to discuss such urgent issues, the International and Comparative Law Research Center and International Institute of International Humanitarian Law. And first of all, I would like to introduce our honorable um, experts. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Uh, Richard Bruce Jackson. Mr. Jackson has an impressive experience of dealing with armed conflict both as an army officer as an, and as an adjudicator. He also has academic experience. Mr. Jackson authored and co-authored a number of publications of international humanitarian law, including our child textbook, The Law of Armed Conflict and Operational Approach. Our next uh, expert is uh, Adi Neef. Adi Neef represents Eurojust as Judicial Cooperation Advisor, and Adi Neef is co-founder of LMA, the Association for the Promotion of International Law. Uh, let me introduce Jean-Paul Laborde, Ruin Ambassador of um, Parliamentary Assembly Mediterranean, Director of the Center of, Exper uh, of Expertise on Counterterrorism Measures of French Military Academy, and now Honorary <coughs> Judge of the French Judicial Supreme Court. And uh, I would like to, uh, our uh, expert Professor Marcus Sassoli, uh, I think um, most of us, or maybe all know Professor Sassoli as a brilliant and experienced lecturer on international humanitarian law and co-authored uh, of the uh, one outstanding course, uh, How Does Law Protect the War? Professor Sassoli has a great experience of working for different, uh, for different international bodies and organizations, including the International Committee of the Red Cross, and he's an expert in the issue involving human rights law, international criminal law, uh, and such a, a state responsibility, a responsibility of states and non-state actors. And Professor Sassoli has been widely published on international humanitarian law, and has a recent, uh, and uh, the recent book is International Humanitarian Law Rules, Controversies, and Solutions for Problems Arising in Warfare. Uh, we I would like to. <clears throat> I would like to introduce uh, Cardula Drogi, but Cardula Drogi uh, in join us uh, a, little, um, a little bit more later, more later, uh, a little bit later, sorry. Uh, and uh, he will join us by Skype. Uh, Cardula represents the International Committee of the Red Cross as the head of the operational law unit of the legal division. And uh, these are great speakers who so will discuss different problems concerning their relation uh, between IHL and uh, human rights law. Uh, 
what our uh, panel is going to be devoted as the problem um, of relation between IHL and human rights law. And uh, uh, if you don't mind, I would like to tell a few words about the subject matter of this, um, of this panel and uh, questions which may be raised uh, during our uh, discussion. Uh, as, <clears throat> as we know, for quite some time, there has been an ongoing scholarly debate on the issues of international protection of individuals in armed conflict in the context of relation between RHL and human rights law. And no matter how complicated theoretical constructions are, uh, the reality turns out to be even more ambiguous. Human rights, of course, must be ensured in the times of peace and in terms of armed conflict. If human rights are violated and individuals seek to protect them in international human rights bodies, it is important to take into account the conditions of the armed conflict when assessing the obligations of state to promote, for example, the right to life or the right to personal integrity. States apply IHL provision as a threshold to limit human rights in armed conflict, for example, by prohibiting arbitrary deprivation of the life in armed conflict. International customs also play a special role as a source of international law. However, the question whether the rules of a particular human rights treaty are applicable in a situation of armed conflict and to what extent, if this is not expressly stated, has not got any unambiguous answer. Uh, here one more problem arises. Respect for human rights is one of the basic principles of international law that binds all actors capable of exercising authority in a certain territory, including non-state actors. Perhaps, maybe it's correct uh, opinion. Uh, the uh, peculiarities of the conditions of armed conflict require an assessment of the circumstances and obligation aimed to ensure, for example, the principle of proportionality or the adoption of precautionary measures, on, measures under IHL. The compliance with IHL should mean or be interpreted in the context of the absence of any violation under human rights law. Maybe it's correct opinion, maybe not. Much contemplation of the interaction and relationship between IHL and human rights law should not, as I think, obscure the fact that IHL and human rights law provide for different legal regimes within which the relevant relations are regulated, but which nevertheless overlap. I want to focus on theory lex generalis and lex specialis. In my opinion, it is very important to the law enforcement, but the interpretation between human rights law and international humanitarian law in the context of lex generalis and lex specialis uh, may be different and independs on concrete situation, independs on special uh, relationship. In any, uh, in any case, uh, I think, uh, as for um, as for armed conflict, uh, we uh, have to apply the international humanitarian law comprehensively and effectively. And uh, uh, now I would like uh, to propose to discuss uh, this issue and other issue to our experts. And I hope we'll discuss not only general questions of interplay between international humanitarian law and human rights law, trying to, to strike balance between IHL and human rights law, but we will discuss special issues, for instance, the use of lethal force against uh, legitimate targets, or maybe internment without trail, or maybe other problem in the discourse of international, of the relation uh, between international humanitarian law and international human rights law, and uh, finding proper ways uh, for applicability of international human rights law in the situation of armed conflict. And uh, let me give the floor to Professor Marcus Sassoli, who will speak on interplay between international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Professor Sassoli, the uh, floor is yours, and if you... <laughs> I would like to tell uh, one minute uh, to, according to our agenda, every expert is given 20 minutes to represent the report, and when we will um, work in this way until 11.20, and when we will have a break, and after all experts present their reports, uh, we may ask questions to our honorable expert, Professor Sassori, welcome.
thank you very much, Professor Sokolova. Uh, thank you to the International and Comparative Law Center and the San Remo Institute to have organized this. I do not have a report. I have uh, some thoughts on this issue, which is uh, fascinating for lawyers, which is symbolically and conceptually important, while I think uh, for the people who are victims of armed conflict, it is not so important. The problem in many armed conflicts today is not that the wrong rules are applied, but that none of the rules are applied, neither humanitarian law nor human rights law. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Bhaktia Tushmo Kamedov to have uh, brought this together, uh, brought us together, and we will certainly have some uh, differing opinions. My starting point is, as you said, that uh, both branches have the same aim and would like to protect human beings, their life, and their dignity. His, there are historically important differences, especially if you compare humanitarian law of international armed conflict and human rights law. Uh, the history of the two is different. The structure of the two branches is different because human rights law foresees subjective individual rights, while humanitarian law consists of objective rules of behavior. Uh, humanitarian law also makes many distinctions, like between armed conflict and non-armed conflict, and it applies only to armed conflict, between international and non-international armed conflict, between civilians and combatants, between a party's own territory and occupied territory, uh, while in human rights law, the basic idea is that all human beings have the same human rights. So this is an important difference. And also the addressees, at least traditionally, it is seen that human rights law is addressed to states, while humanitarian law, it is uncontroversial that it is uh, addressed to both uh, states and armed groups, but also the many criminalized rules are addressed uh, to every human being. Uh, and finally, I would say, um, and this has to be recalled because somehow the, co the concept of humanitarian law, and I always use this terminology, but it is somehow misleading because it gives the impression that it is very humanitarian, while human rights law is more humanitarian than uh, humanitarian law, but humanitarian law is more realistic for a situation which should be avoided, which mm -hmm. are uh, armed conflict. Now, the interplay between the two, I think first uh, we need to clarify when the two apply. And humanitarian law does not apply when there is no armed conflict. And traditionally, many states, even when there is an armed conflict, they deny that there is an armed conflict. And if this is so, we should re recall them that uh, then they admit that only human rights law and human rights law fully applies and therefore there's no question of interplay. On the other hand, uh, human rights law applies uh, certainly on the territory of a state while there is controversy whether and to what extent it applies extraterritorially, so sometimes only humanitarian law would apply to an, uh, an operation. And as I said, with certain uh, addressees like armed groups or individuals, it is not so clear whether they are bound by human rights law. Finally, there can be derogations from most rules of human rights law in a situation threatening the life of the nation and an armed conflict threatens the life of the nation. But when both apply, then I think uh, 
on most issues, both uh, lead to the same result. But we are obviously here as lawyers fascinated about the few issues where they don't lead to the same result. Uh, and here the first question is, when is there a contradiction? Uh, what does contradiction mean? Does it only mean when one branch prescribes something and the other prohibits it? If this was the meaning of contradiction, I'm aware of only one example under the Fort Geneva Convention on Occupying Power may bring uh, inhabitants of the occupied territory only before military courts, while at least according to the European Court on Human Rights, uh, civilians may not be brought before military courts. So here there's a clear contradiction. But I think that uh, divergences go well beyond such contradictions. Let's take the example of the possibility to intern prisoners of war without further reasons and without any judicial procedure. Under humanitarian law, this is not an obligation. So if we were purely formalistic, we could say there's no contradiction because uh, humanitarian law does not oblige to intern them, while human rights law would prohibit to intern them without a judicial procedure. But uh, it is the very essence of humanitarian law that uh, you can intern prisoners of war, and it is in the logic because they belong to the military potential of the enemy. And therefore, here I think there is a contradiction, and I would solve it clearly that here um, humanitarian law constitutes the lex specialis. And this leads us to the issue how to solve uh, divergences between the two branches and the majority opinion is to say uh, this must be solved by the principle of lex specialis but unfortunately there is no agreement on what that means lex specialis i clearly reject the idea that lex specialis means that humanitarian law always prevails including when it does not state a rule uh, which would be uh, qualified silence. But some people claim that. Um, I think Lex Specialis is not either a relationship between two branches, but it is a relationship between two norms. And here I'm with the International Law Commission in its report on fragmentation. It's between two norms in relation to certain facts. Uh, one of my students has once very well defined that as we have to look for the greater common surface area between the rule and the facts. And if the greater common surface area is between IHL and the facts, then the IHL rule prevails. And if it is rather human rights, then the human rights rule. Uh, prevails. I use, but this has no practical um, consequences. Also, uh, some people get very angry when I say that, in my view, both humanitarian law and human rights law can constitute a lex specialis. But if you prepare to say humanitarian law is sometimes a lex specialis and sometimes we apply the lex generalis, the result is exactly the same. So sorry for my terminology. I think on certain issues, human rights law is in armed conflicts, the lex specialis, freedom of press, freedom of opinion, is simply not foreseen, for instance, in uh, international humanitarian uh, law. So, uh, what do, does all this mean in practice? And you mentioned uh, some delicate uh, issues, particularly in non-international armed conflict, because I think uh, in international armed conflict, uh, as we have very developed rules of international humanitarian law, when we have a rule on an issue, this rule will nearly always constitute lex specialis. I should, however, mention that there is a growing tendency to reject the very idea of Lex Specialis and rather to speak about systemic integration. 
uh, to say that uh, simply we have to interpret both branches taking into account the other branches and uh, one judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, um, the Hassan case, uh, goes into this direction. I think it often leads to the same result. Simply one explanation is more credible than the other and it depends on the circumstances. For instance, when we come to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the prohibition of arbitrary deprivation of liberty, I think it is logical to say uh, systemic integration. We have to interpret the term arbitrary in an armed conflict taking uh, international humanitarian law into account. While if we have, for instance, in the European Convention on Human Rights, an exhaustive list of reasons for which a person can be deprived of liberty, then I don't see how you can make a, 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 a systemic integration by saying, and we add another reason. But here I think Lex Specialis is the correct uh, explanation. And this is in particular of importance in non-international armed conflicts. Uh, and you mentioned the two issues, uh, if I may call them killing and detention. Um, underlying, there is one question, to what extent the prevailing opinion that we can make and we should make as many analogies as possible between international and non-international armed conflict to what extent this leads also humanitarian law where no rule of the uh, treaties applicable to non-international armed conflict exists, this analogy rule would become lex specialis. Now you will say, ah, but we have customary law. But in my view, customary law is not an issue of lex specialis. We determine what is the customary law for every situation based on state practice and opinion juris. And it is not an issue of lex specialis in customary law, in my opinion. And the second important issue is whether international humanitarian law provides for authorizations. And this is, in my view, purely a human rights issue. Because under human rights law, you need a legal basis, for instance, to detain someone. And the question is simply, can humanitarian law offer the necessary legal basis under human rights law? But this presupposes already that we have determined that the situation is covered by, humanitarian, by human rights law. And simply, humanitarian law like the law of the sea, may provide for a legal basis for detention, I think, in international armed conflicts is thus. In non-international armed conflicts, it does not. But please don't misunderstand me. This does not mean that it is unlawful to detain enemies in uh, non-international armed conflicts. Under IHL, it is certainly not unlawful. But the question is whether the IHL rule alone offers a sufficient legal basis under uh, human rights law. And I would answer no. But this does not yet decide whether human rights law or humanitarian law prevails on this issue. And I think this is often uh, confused. My final remark is perhaps on implementation um, of one branch by the implementing mechanisms of the other branch. And here we can have both human rights bodies who implement humanitarian law, and we can have, uh, in particular, the ICRC, which invokes and implements human rights law. Now, first for the human rights bodies, implementing humanitarian law, uh, why do they do that? Uh, the reason is simply that individuals do not have a mechanism under human rights law, uh, under humanitarian law, so they have somehow to translate their 
humanitarian law violation into a human rights violation to be able to go to an international body, because obviously the ICSC makes a wonderful work, but it is not a body to which you can appeal to get your right. Um, and the construction, how you can justify that, depends of every uh, institution. Some human rights bodies have an explicit mandate also to apply uh, humanitarian law, for instance, the UN Human Rights Council and the Committee on the Rights of the Child. In other cases, uh, one entry point is obviously the possibility to derogate from uh, human rights treaties, which is limited by all kinds of conditions. And one condition is that the derogation must be compatible with other international obligations of the state. And therefore, a human rights body has to check whether the derogation is compatible with international humanitarian law. Another possibility is to interpret. Uh, human rights law in light of humanitarian law when there's an armed conflict. I already said, mentioned uh, the concept of arbitrary detention, which would be what is arbitrary in armed conflicts. It is humanitarian law, which decides that. And, but this is more problematic. Uh, one could also argue that a human rights body has to take the Lex Specialis to apply the Lex Specialis, if it is the Lex Specialis. Uh, because finally, a uh, human rights court or committee uh, should not uh, find a state in violation of its obligation if under international law the state did what it uh, should do. So in my view, this question of jurisdiction, may a human rights body uh, apply humanitarian law, it must apply it if it constitutes a lex specialis, but often it is obviously controversial whether it uh, constitutes a lex specialis. Now, I was all asked by the organizers, and I do that very uh, voluntarily, uh, to speak also about the risks when human rights bodies apply international humanitarian law. Well, the first risk, but here I sound like a professor, sorry for that, is simply that they don't know humanitarian law, and therefore they misapply it. But to hear the solution of a professor would be, OK, let's train them. But judges don't like to be trained, so we have to wait some time until our students become the judges and they were trained when they were students. And behind it, there is nevertheless a philosophical uh, question. I was astonished last week. Uh, I spoke with a very eminent human rights uh, not activist, but uh, a person in the office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And I was mentioning, we were discussing about targeted killings. And I said, you know, under humanitarian law, this is what we want. Uh, targeted killings, not indiscriminate killings. And she was shocked. And she said, Marco, how can you say you want to have targeted killing? And this is the correct feeling under human rights law, while under humanitarian <laughs> law, it's just the different one. So this is more a philosophical uh, issue. Um, then obviously, th there, is, uh, there is a risk that I don't think there's a risk when they apply humanitarian law correctly. While if they prefer human rights law, then there's a risk that we have unrealistic solutions and unrealistic rules don't protect anyone and undermine the credibility of international law. For instance, with the military, when you told, tell them, ask the European Court, of human rights said in the Al Jalut case that there must be an inquiry after each dead, and the dead um, in the inquiry, the family must be impl uh, implied in the inquiry. Um, when the military hear that, they say, okay, imagine we bomb, and then we must make an inquiry, and we have to, to put the family of the uh, victims into, to involve them into the inquiry. Beyond that, uh, 
and I come to the issue of killing in a non-international armed conflict, I think one has to differentiate. But it is true that if in Afghanistan uh, forces arrest, capture, I would say, a Taliban fighter, uh, it is important that someone checks whether that is a Taliban fighter or a taxi driver. But to foresee a full habeas corpus procedure may in this situation be unrealistic because simply you will not have enough evidence before a court or you, the, the soldier has to say, I have to stop fighting because now I have to go to, to testify to the court. And not all soldiers are carabinieri who are accustomed to, to fill in a form as soon as they capture someone. They, they arrest. Carabinieri do not capture, they arrest. And that's a very big difference. So, but I think my Afghanistan example is valid for people arrested in fighting, while if someone is arrested in his or her house in Kabul, then there should be habeas corpus. So, again, it depends very much of the situation. So, to conclude, I would suggest that uh, there is a lot of convergence between the two, but additional convergence would lead to unrealistic rules. While it is very important that we give, and here I fully agree with what you said, General Battisti, the soldiers must get not uh, a lecture on Lex Specialis, how it is interpreted by Sassoli, but clear instructions, do this or do this. And for instance, in Colombia, there was blue card, red card. I thought this is a good idea to have a blue card. This is a law enforcement situation. A red card, this is a conduct of hostilities situation. And then obviously you have to train them to be able to distinguish between law enforcement and uh, conduct of hostilities situations. And as I said, I think on both sides, there should be a full training. Obviously, being the director of the Geneva Academy, I'm always in favor of training, because then we get money. But uh, no, I really believe it's not because we get money that I believe that both human rights people should be trained in IHL and um, the military should also understand that human rights law is not something abstract which will apply exactly in the same way in an armed conflict than in peacetime. Thank you very much. Thank, th thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sole. It's a very interesting and com comprehensive report, and I think it's a uh, firm basis for our further discussions. And I, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Uh, Richard Jackson, who will speak about the, uh, who will continue discussion of the relationship between IHL and human rights law and will use practical examples of the special uses in international armed conflict. On? No, he's on no lights. No. How about yours? Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Natalia, and and uh, international human rights law. This uh, presentation, which usually goes about an hour, um, it, I, I'm going to condense, of course, for. Oh. Okay. Um, uh, I've, I've given this presentation here at San Remo at uh, the International uh, Institute on Humanitarian Law at our detention workshops, which we conducted annually um, over most of the last 10 years. And uh, my partner in crime was a, was a human rights lawyer, Francois Hampson, who many of you know from the UK. And we first started out, the first time we, we did the the uh, point counterpoint between us banging heads a lot, but by the end uh, we came to uh, a very uh, 
complementary understanding of the relationship between the two bodies of law, and I, and I hope we can get there in the short 20 minutes that we have. Uh, now, in, in my view, uh, the debate is not a conflict of laws discussion. It's not a question of whether one body of law supplants another body of law. And in the Hassan case, which uh, Marco mentioned, uh, the, the court early on rejects lex specialis, but I'm not really sure in reading that case closely whether or not it's rejecting it as a conflict of laws displacement theory, or um, if you read it closely and look at the latter part of the, of the case, it really imply, applies a lex specialis as an interpretive canon, because when you get to the hard questions that arise in this conflict uh, uh, between the two, um, it, the, the court goes to international humanitarian law to answer the, the hard, hard specific questions, like, for instance, was Mr. Hassan properly um, uh, detained and uh, was he properly turned over to another party to the conflict to the U.S.? And then was he given the process that he was due according to international humanitarian law or according to uh, human rights law? And the court concluded that he was given uh, the rights uh, of a detainee under Article 78 of the Fourth Convention, um, which were appropriate for those circumstances. So. Um, I, I think even in those, those cases where uh, we find people rejecting the theory of, of lex specialis, there are not, there's a way to look at the, at the law to say that the, the two bodies of law are acting in a complementary fashion. Uh, the U.S. approach has been uh, to uh, apply, apply the general principles common to both bodies of law and provide that as a training standard so that wherever we go, whatever type of conflict we go to, we can train our soldiers to a standard that, uh, that will apply in whatever circumstance. I, I know in my involvement in a number of conflicts over the years, I, didn't, I never got from on high a, uh, a definition of what kind of conflict I was involved in. Nobody ever said, you're going to you're, you're involved in this conflict in Panama, where I was the uh, legal advisor at the POW camp in in uh, Panama. Uh, they didn't say it was a non-international armed conflict. They didn't say it was an international armed conflict. They didn't tell me what uh, law I, I should apply. So what I did was I pulled our doctrine off the shelf on POW operations, and and we followed the norms that are appropriate for armed conflict, prisoner of war operations, when we captured, uh, when we captured uh, Panama Defense Forces uh, folks, or when we captured uh, somebody who was, uh, took a criminal in, or one of the crazy people Noriega let out of the insane asylums, we applied uh, the fourth convention rules. So, uh, but later on I came to find out that the U.S. declared it was a non-international armed conflict and we had come in at the last minute um, in support of what we viewed as the legitimate Panamanian government. So I didn't, we didn't really have to apply those uh, rules, uh, but that was what we were trained to do, and I, and I think it was the right thing to do to do that. Uh, so Marco touched on some of these issues, but I'd like to drill down on some of them too. Um, the triggers of, inter of armed conflict uh, are identified in Common Article 2 and Common Article 3, and they're very different, but they both define the situation as an armed conflict. So I, I, I'm just going to leap to that, to, the, to um, assuming that we're, we're talking about situations of armed conflict, and then try and, and talk about how uh, there is, it will be a difference in how those uh, two are interpreted. Uh, Extraterritorial application of human rights, many states apply those, uh, that term very differently based on, if you're a positivist, based on the words of the treaties that we're applying. So the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights talks about application in the territory and those uh, subject to the jurisdiction. They use, the, the treaty uses the conjunctive and um, 
so that the, our interpretation, the interpretation of the Canadians and many other states that, that apply the ICCPR is that it, that this treaty was about the relationship between a state and its citizens, the people subject to its jurisdiction in its territory. So uh, uh, is it by, uh, is it intended to be applied in a non-international armed conflict where a state is intervening or at the request of a, of a, a third state is uh, being involved in the, in the conflict. And that's, that's where the extraterritorial um, application of human rights comes in. Now, in treaty interpretation, uh, it's very important uh, to understand what, whether or not those treaties are self-executing, whether or not the state has taken reservations, understandings, or declarations with regard to that treaty. For example, there are many states that uh, take the ICCPR and say, this applies by, with, and through my, uh, my constitution. That's the approach the U.S. takes. If you read the, the um, uh, legislative history of, the, of our um, ratification of that treaty. And, and it, when we uh, ratified the ICCPR, we told Congress that we didn't need to execute the treaty because it was already executed through our, our domestic law. Other states, for example, say they apply the ICCPR through the Quran in, in an Islamic state, for example. So there, um, and then there are others uh, that take specific reservations to, uh, or understandings with respect to specific provisions of, uh, of, of those treaties. Okay, this is a, um, this is a chart that I borrowed from the ICRC, uh, and I, I've, I've really only added a couple of things. This notation that human rights law is the law of peace. That's the traditional way when I was taught international law that we, we looked at uh, human rights law. And um, the law of armed conflict or international humanitarian law is the law of armed conflict and never the twain shall meet. Um, uh, when, when you're in an armed conflict, the law of peace uh, disappears, essentially. Well, we've, we've, um, we've changed that view in, in many states over the years. And uh, this, this uh, green um, portion of the slide shows that, as, as Marco said, as you move into a non-international armed conflict that's threatening the state, uh, the state may, may take derogations or certain provisions of their of their human rights law will not apply in, in a non-international armed conflict, and very few, if any, apply during uh, international armed conflict. But we always have the use Kogan's or customary international law um, norms that would apply even in uh, international armed conflict. Uh, well, so I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about this issue, but, uh, but I will, uh, I think we can later talk a little bit more about Sadr Mohammed, which is the case that uh, Marco referred to regarding the authority to, uh, to detain in a non-international armed conflict. It'll be very interesting to see what the European Court of Human Rights does with that case and the choice of the UK Supreme Court to uh, rely on the mandate of the United Nations to conduct um, detention operations as the authority to detain. Um, I personally believe that there, there is customary international law um, detention authority, and I'll show you where that comes from in, in, uh, in my own state. Um, the, the North, I call this the North American response because we have an interesting case out of Canada, Amnesty v. Chad, that says that rather than apply their uh, statutory constitution or, or human rights uh, bill in Afghanistan, that instead um, the law of armed conflict would apply to a, uh, a detention in Afghanistan and the turnover of individuals from Canadian armed forces to the Afghan government. The DOD, US DOD law of war manual said that the, uh, that the law uh, of armed conflict is the lex specialis in, um, or the controlling body of law in armed conflict situa situations. Okay, what does that mean though? If it's the controlling body of law, does it mean it's uh, that 
LOAC displaces uh, human rights, or does it mean that there's a complementary relationship, but the, the prevailing rule um, uh, in this conflict of norms, as Marco calls it, uh, would come from IHL. And that's, it's that complementary relationship that, I, that um, I'd like to demonstrate here. Uh, we, the U.S. has looked at uh, the nuclear weapons case and the wall case to, to study this Lex Specialis issue. Uh, and I'll, I'll illustrate one of the, uh, uh, a targeting situation from uh, using the nuclear weapons approach. But the wall said, the case said, sometimes IHL is the, and this is in a long-term occupation of the, in the Palestinian um, West Bank of, of, uh, of uh, the West Bank. Um, <laughs> I, I, I hesitate to characterize it. Um, because there's a lot of dispute about that. But um, the, the Wall case says sometimes it's a IHL matter as Lex Specialis, sometimes it's a um, IHRL matter, um, and, uh, and, and sometimes the two are, are competing uh, straight on. Think about uh, a property issue, for example. How, what, what property law would you apply as an occupying power in the Israeli-occupied uh, West Bank? A really difficult question that I'm sure um, Ad, Addy can talk about. Um, but, but for targeting, for example, the uh, quote, targeted killings uh, issues, uh, principally the uh, IHL uh, rules are applied. While um, with respect to detention, uh, mostly IHL rules, but, but um, some human rights law uh, builds in there. Okay, so um, I, I think it, it, this is o overlooked, and that's the customary international law provisions that apply here. Um, what, what I'm talking about here, I'll illustrate in, uh, in, in a couple of slides. First, let's talk about targeting. This is the easiest uh, example of uh, IHL application. In the Bankovich case, uh, the European Court of Human Rights essentially goes to um, the nuclear weapons case, uh, if you read, read it closely in between the lines, because the, the it, Bankovich, they, they say, well, we're, t we're interpreting the dropping of bombs from 10,000 feet. How can we apply human rights law to that activity? Um, and, and, and so in, uh, in the application of law to the battlefield of targeting, targeting is about um, avoiding indiscriminate targets, as, uh, as Marco alluded to previously, and it's, uh, it's about um, choosing with some degree of precision, the, not the same level of precision that's required of a police officer, but with a, a degree of uh, precision regarding a reasonable belief that the target is um, a lawful uh, military objective. Um, so, What's the, what's the customary international law um, uh, provision that might, might apply? Well, it's arbitrary deprivation of life. But how do you define what's arbitrary in that context? Um, you don't define it by having a warrant to execute a, a, a tar the target on the ground. You, ha you define it by the IHL provisions that I've talked about that are mostly included in additional protocol one. So distinction, proportionality, and precautions in the attack are applied to that situation. And, and the, the ICJ nuclear weapons case direct, puts us in that direction. The US example here, the best one, is the Al-Awlaki white paper. Um, and some speeches by uh, Attorney General Holder, who talked about uh, the arbitrary deprivation of life standard, and then said it's not interpreted in the same way as it would be in a, in a judicial uh, warrant case, it, it's interpreted in, through the lens of international humanitarian law. Okay, here, this has been modified slightly, as you'll see, because the way that, that uh, the U.S. and many other states that are involved in non-international armed conflicts uh, apply IHL is they come in with their, their international armed conflict standards. They bring, them, bring it with them. As I said, their soldiers are trained to IHL 
at an international armed conflict standard. There isn't a whole lot of law down here in common article three, and there isn't a whole lot more in additional protocol two. Um, so instead, what, what we do as a matter of policy, when we are being asked to provide support to a nation in the middle of a non-international armed conflict, is we start with our international armed conflict standards. It's the example I gave you in Panama. I, um, later on, we talked in Panama about turning our detainees over to the newly reconstituted government of Panama. We did the same thing in Afghanistan. We did the same thing in Iraq. Is in, in the end, and, and soldiers have to understand that in the end, the, the non-international armed conflict is going to end and the law of peace is going to be restored. So uh, international human rights law is critically important for that nation where the conflict's going on. So uh, we can interact and, and work towards this standard Essentially, a, a third nation coming into a NIAC comes from the right to the left, and the, the country involved in the uh, NIAC comes from the left to the right in defining what law applies to their situation. Uh, so let's look at, at the CIL standard. Prolonged arbitrary de detention is prohibited. Uh, that's, a, that's pretty much an agreement throughout the world that that's a customary international law standard. The U.S. in our third restatement of foreign relations law agrees that that's the customary international law standard, uh, human rights standard to apply to detention. But then how do you define those terms? What's, what's arbitrary? We'll talk about due process in a second. Uh, what's, what's prolonged? For your nation, if you're detaining somebody, how long before you have to present them to a magistrate? It differs in many different countries. It's 72 hours, or uh, there, there, there may be uh, in a state of emergency two weeks, or no, or no time limit whatsoever on presenting somebody to a magistrate. So that what's prolonged in the, in a human rights analysis varies across the world, and uh, and and you can't really give a rule of thumb to the soldier. How about? using uh, the, the rules that uh, international humanitarian law provide, that you're detained for the duration of the conflict um, under, uh, under um, the third convention. Uh, and you're detained for as long as the threat to security exists in an occupation under the fourth convention. So those are good rules of, of thumb to use uh, to define what's arbitrary in, uh, in uh, an armed conflict. Okay, I'm going to skip detainee treatment and go straight to due process because it's another good example of how these two bodies of law interact. Uh, if we had gone, if we had started in Afghanistan conducting Article 5 tribunals, I think this saga would have been very different. But the mistake the U.S. government made was to reject Article 5 tribunals and to treat, um, although it's a reasonable interpretation of Article 5 to say that um, when there is doubt as to an individual status, they would be given an Article 5 tribunal means that the government can say there is no doubt in all these circumstances. Um, I think that was the wrong decision to make, that, that what we should have done in order to individualize as the first, uh, as AP1 does, to individualize the decision each uh, detainee in Afghanistan initially should have been given an Article 5 tribunal. Later, we moved to an Article 78 uh, process, and, uh, and that was what carried us over into criminal detention in Afghanistan later on. But this Hamdi case is interesting. This is uh, an analysis of how the U.S. has, a, has, uh, has uh, established this complementary relationship between the two bodies of law. Hamdi did two things that are interesting in this respect. Hamdi said that the, the Congress authorized the use of force against uh, the Taliban, uh, Al-Qaeda, and its associated forces. And, uh, and Judge O'Connor in that case said, well, uh, if they're authorized to use force to kill people, then they ought to be authorized as incidental to this use of force authorization to detain. 
It's a very logical uh, approach to this issue. And what and Justice O'Connor said that this, this um, authority to detain is incident to or a subset of the authority to conduct uh, armed conflict. And that's, a, that's an approach Sadr Muhammad could have taken. And in fact, it was discussed in, in both, uh, both case, levels of cases, but not adopted by the British court. Um, as a result of that, uh, Hamdi also said that, that uh, administrative due process was sufficient uh, for a detainee on the battlefield. So this is a human rights standard. And then she adopted the procedures that were developed at, for uh, Article Five tribunals in uh, uh, U.S. domestic doctrine, our, uh, Army Regulation 190-8, that, that uh, established a three-person tribunal um, to, be, to assess uh, individuals' detention status under Article Five, And these were later adopted also for Article 78 process in uh, the Combatant Status Review Board and Administrative Review Boards for the Guantanamo detainees. Um, as I said earlier, Hassan also adopted the, that, those Article 78 reviews. But then seven years later, Mr. Boumediene, who had been detained in Bosnia um, right, right before uh, my, my division was, uh, uh, became the MND North uh, Division there, uh, Mr. Boumediene was a jihadi who was allegedly on R&R, or rest and recreation in Bosnia, awaiting a tour, tour back on the battlefield, and he was and he had been do, conducting um, uh, a, a reconnaissance of the U.S. embassy, and so he was detained as a security threat, and moved to to uh, to um, Guantanamo with a bunch of uh, other Al, Al Qaeda folks, and uh, Judge Stevens looked at this and said. Uh, Look, it's been seven years. Yeah, um, Justice uh, O'Connor said administrative due process notice and opportunity to respond was enough uh, up to seven years. But now, um, as, uh, as Marco alluded to, it's time to, to apply habeas corpus standards. So getting judicial review of their status and getting their, um, and get, having have it, had a lawyer represent them uh, before those, uh, those habeas proceedings was uh, now appropriate. So over time, as you, go, as you go back to this slide, over time, even, even our Supreme Court says, yeah, you can start with this, this approach, but you better be moving to the human rights approach um, as, as time progresses. And they, they gave three standards for that. Um, the location where it's being conducted or where they're being held, the um, infrastructure, the legal infrastructure that's, uh, that's available, and time. And those three factors move um, the body of law that's applied from IHL to IHRL, or um, human rights standards. OK, I'm, uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, belabor these, these other areas, because we, we really don't have the time. But, uh, I, I want to emphasize this one other point is that, um, and that that's, uh, was on that slide there, is in the Copenhagen uh, principles agreed upon by many of our allies in the, uh, uh, the non-international armed conflict where a state is sending troops to support another state that's involved in non-international armed conflict, um, about a little over 100 states agreed to the Copenhagen principles that reflect uh, Additional Protocol 2 standards, Additional Protocol 1, Article 75 standards, and Common Article 3 standards for detention. So notice about uh, being detained. Um, some uh, periodic review that they adopted from the, uh, the Common Article 2 conflict standards in Article 78. Periodic review is built in there. Um, uh, and uh, Family notification, family uh, interaction is added in there, which is something completely outside of, of IHL, but is brought in from human rights law. So there's an amalgamation of human rights standards and IHL standards in the Copenhagen principles, which is 
uh, which many states have agreed um, would, would apply for their detention activities in armed conflict. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And this presentation will be available uh, uh, to uh, the attendees of the conference. I've got notes sl pages that go along with these slides and explain the other, other slides that I didn't have time to cover today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jackson. And we will continue our uh, discussion. Uh, and I um, would like to invite Abdullah Droje. She is going to join us. Hello. Hello. Hello, Cardula. Hello. Can you okay. see me and can you hear me? Yes, yes. And uh, you, you can start your report. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, thank you also for um, including me on the panel via, via video link. I'm very sorry I couldn't make it to, uh, to San Remo. Um, all the more because I, I think already, uh, you know, the, the panel has been so rich with Marco's and, and Dick Jackson's presentations, and um, it's it's a subject that's very close to my heart. So um, I, I'm I'm very happy to um, to try to say a few words now. I see that the time's already quite advanced, so I'll keep my remarks hopefully um, quite short. Also, because um, Marco and um, and 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 Dick have have um, you know covered already a lot of ground. I, I do want to come back on, on quite a few of the things that Marco said and, and perhaps complement them a little bit. Um, and, and starting basically from the fact that we have different origins and philosophies that underpin human rights and humanitarian law. Then perhaps saying a bit more about the rapprochement of the two bodies of law over time. Um, and then um, ending a little bit with opportunities that this presents, but also risks that this presents. So as, as Marco was saying, I think we, we always, when, when we talk about human rights and IHL and how they apply in armed conflict, we have to remember that they are bodies of law that have a different history. Human rights law is really a body of law that um, was created to protect citizens against the arbitrary power of states. And in that sense, I think it's, you know, its philosophy and also its, its, its history is a history of um, vindication. Um, do you remember the, um, the, the, the book by Mary Wollstonecraft, a vindication of the rights of, of women and, and a vindication of the rights of men. And we, we need to remember this, this rights-based approach that you have. And, and on the contrary, um, humanitarian law was a, a law that would, was crafted between belligerents um, in the 19th century. I mean, starting sort of to be um, the modern international humanitarian law starting in the 19th century. And as Marco said, they were rules of behavior that agreed upon between states for the benefits, first of their soldiers and, and then later in the 20th century for the benefits of civilians. So it's a charitable law. It's not a law that is based on the vindication of rights by the victims of armed conflict. And those philosophies are important because they also then inform, I think, the way these, these bodies of laws have been used um, but, but, but more importantly, perhaps the processes that have developed from them. And so that's the first difference, I think. And it, it creates these different implementation mechanisms that Marco has already talked about. And it is, I think it's the philosophies underpinning them, which have led humanitarian law to be a body of law that is very much preventive. So it's a body of law that's meant to apply already on the battlefield. It's the body has very practical rules of behavior and interestingly about that it's it's a body of law that's very detailed uh, Marco was saying it makes many distinctions for instance as opposed to the sort of much more aspirational uh, treaties that you have in human rights law um, but it's also very detailed because it's based on the experience of soldiers in the battlefield and 
um, some of the rules that I really love, for instance, about international humanitarian law, are the rules on the dead. And that's because these rules are about the experiences of soldiers on the battlefield. Um, and they're very detailed about how soldiers, how do you have to inform the next of kin, uh, how do you have to mark the graves, uh, and so on and so forth. And so these are very, you know, practical laws. Um, now, um, in terms of, and, and sorry, and the other thing that is the remedies. So you have the, the IHL, that's, that's this practical rules, but it doesn't have many remedies for, for, for the victims. Why? Because, again, it's a charitable body of law um, in, its, in its beginnings. I'm not saying that this should be the philosophy now, but I'm just talking about the beginnings and, and, uh, and the philosophy underpinning it. Um, and it doesn't provide either for, for remedies, whereas human rights law provides for remedies and individual remedies. It's an individualized body of law. And, and that has uh, consequences, I think, later on. Um, then just a, a word about this Lex Specialis and Lex Generalis um, question. Again, I think it goes from the fact that human rights law in its conceptualization is meant for peacetime. Um, it then, it has, and for instance, the European Convention on Human Rights is very explicit has very explicit derogation rules for the situation of armed conflict. But the philosophy underpinning it is one of peacetime, of regulated government, um, and again, about the relationship between the citizen and the government. Um, whereas for, for humanitarian law, war is the normal situation. And so the, the paradigms are very different in terms of their outlook. And what does it mean? I mean, Peacetime is, should be the normal, and therefore human rights law is the lex generalis. It continues to apply in armed um, conflict because human rights nowadays are seen as inherent to the human being, and therefore the human being carries human rights uh, with uh, him or her, whether during war or during, uh, during peace. But of course, humanitarian law... Um, regulates the specific situations of armed conflict. I would agree, and, and in that sense, is obviously, I would argue that that's, that as a broad statement, I think that's correct. But I also agree with Marco that it is much more a question of conflicts of norms rather than conflicts of bodies of law. So when we use the Lex Specialis rule, we really have to look at the specific situations. And um, as a sort of a broad rule of thumb, I would say that for most international armed conflicts, and I leave aside the situation of, of occupation, um, because they are usually fought extraterritorially in a way uh, for both states, um, they imply um, big armies fighting against each other. And so therefore, and they are very, um, and the, their regulation is very detailed in the four Geneva Conventions and in uh, additional Protocol One and customary law that comes with it. But the treaty rules on international armed conflict are very um, uh, dense. And in that sense, um, Marco was talking about, uh, you know, the, the overlap between the situation and the rules, and of course the overlap, uh, the, uh, the overlapping surface between the rules on international armed conflict. Uh, and the situation of international armed conflict is very dense. That's very different for non-international armed conflicts because for non-international armed conflicts, um, again, human rights law uh, has far more rules, um, although they are broader, um, but treaty law of non-international armed conflict is fairly scarce, particularly for those states that have not ratified uh, additional protocol two, which is the exception, but still. Um, and then you have customary law, um, but but there I would say it is often much more complex to determine where is really the biggest surface uh, of convergence between the rule and um, and the situation. Now, why has there been such a rapprochement? I think even though I was talking before but, but about the different philosophies underpinning the two, they also have commonalities, of course, in their philosophy, and that is that they need to protect the human dignity, human rights, um, human life uh, and, and, um, and, and physical integrity. And in that sense, they share 
a humanitarian, humanistic, and human, uh, you know, human dignity uh, agenda. And in that sense, I think is why they have often been looked at as converging bodies of law, because of course, also the actors that care about uh, these issues often will, will try to use the bodies of law that most um, advance um, human dignity and in armed conflict. There's also been uh, a densification of um, IHL treaty law. So in 49, when the conventions were written, there was hardly any human rights law. Now we have many treaties and quite detailed treaties about rights of children, rights of women, um, and so on and so forth, disabilities, enforced disappearances, and all of these issues are relevant uh, in armed conflict situations. And so it goes to, uh, you know, it stands to reason that um, we have to take them into account. And more than that, even, even though you have um, very aspirational and in a way very succinct treaties in human rights, the jurisprudence of human rights body has densified as well. And so if I come back, for instance, about the treatment of the dead, while um, IHL has much more uh, detailed treaty rules on this, but of course human rights jurisprudence now has just as much detail as the treaty rules. You don't find them in the treaty of human rights, but you find them in the, in the jurisprudence and perhaps even more than what you would find in IHL. And, um, and often that's seen as part of the body of law of human rights. Jurisprudence is very important in human rights law, and it's seen as part of the body uh, of that law. And that's jurisprudence by international courts, so binding, like the European Court of Human Rights or the, um, or the Inter-American Courts of Human Rights, but also, of course, um, the sort of soft law jurisprudence, for instance, by the uh, uh, committees, uh, the UN committees that are attached to the, to the, treaty uh, to the treaties. Um, and another phenomenon, I think, and, and, and that we have to look at is that, and, and Marco was talking about this as well, is the recourse of victims to the remedies that are available to them. If they don't have individual remedies in, um, in humanitarian law, they will go for the remedies that they have. And that's been very clear, particularly as, as, your, as your conference is, is also um, you know, um, quite focused on, on the European Court of Human Rights, it's very evident in places like Russia or Turkey. And, um, and in, in, in an additional aspect, I think, is the denial of some states that conflicts are occurring on their, on their territory. And so if as a state you deny that a conflict is occurring on your territory, then of course you have to rely on the body of human rights, or you cannot rely on IHL. And, uh, and in that sense, in a way, you can't have it both ways. You can't have an armed conflict, but deny IHL, but also then deny the applicability of human rights law. Um, and an, an, an important aspect, I think, that we shouldn't underestimate is reparations. Um, victims also need reparations. Um, they want them both for a sense of justice, but they also often need them simply economically, for instance, you know, uh, women heads of households whose, um, whose husbands have gone missing, etc. These things are important for them. You don't get that in, in, in IHL. There's a controversy whether in international humanitarian law there is an individual right to reparation. The more traditional view is that there isn't, whereas, of course, in human rights law you have it. And so from the perspective of the victims, in terms of remedies and reparations, human rights law is an avenue that, in a way, will provide you with more of a sense of justice um, and perhaps more of a sense of, of um, you know, reparation, which isn't to say that it doesn't necessarily come too late. It isn't also, you know, it sounds, even though I'm ICSC, I'm dismissing humanitarian law, that's not what I mean. I think humanitarian law has mechanisms, for instance, uh, the way the ICSC works, that are very sort of on the ground mechanisms that are there um, to try to prevent violations from happening, to try to have a dialogue with parties to conflicts about how to improve their respect for uh, international humanitarian law. Um, but from the perspective, I think, from the, of the individual victim, um, it's, it's, uh, it's quite different. Now, the other thing that I think um, has changed, it's the last uh, thing I will talk about in, in terms of the rapprochement between the two. I talked about uh, before the fact that um, 
um, IHL is, is, is less dense in non-international armed conflict, but it just so happens that these are the majority of conflicts around the world. So it's also, I think, one of the reasons why human rights has become more prominent in armed conflict situations, because we have far more non-international armed conflicts. And non-international armed conflicts, then, of course, you have this overlap um, between um, the obligations of belligerents and the relationship of the citizens with their government, because non-international armed, armed conflict still um, is mostly fought uh, within those states, even though, of course, you then have the extraterritorial element um, through partnering operations that comes in more and more, and that Dick Jackson talked about quite a lot. So I won't come back to that so much, even though I think it's a very important um, area to look at. Now, the other thing is prolonged occupations. And in particular, of course, the occupation of the West Bank, which has created a big body of jurisprudence in the Israeli courts, which is important um, and, and I think sets a certain precedent. Um, but also the fact that conflicts are protracted. So not only are non-international armed conflicts the majority of conflicts, but they are also long. And over the time, um, people have to live their lives. And in a way, IHL, although IHL in its norms doesn't have a limitation in time, um, and it is applicable throughout the conflict, and of course, once hostilities breaks out, and, and, and there I completely agree with both with Marco and Dick said, um, when you have hostilities breaking out, the rules on the conduct of hostilities, distinction, proportionality, precaution, remain the governing rules of such hostilities. But when you look at non-international armed conflicts over the past decades, they ebb and flow, um, and a lot of people are not in areas of hostilities in those conflicts, which isn't to say they're not affiliated to some uh, non-state armed groups, which isn't to say they're not in areas where non-state armed groups are present, um, but they still need to go about their normal lives. They're not in a permanent situation of emergency, which is in a way the philosophy in, of international humanitarian law. So if you think, for instance, of the conflict in Colombia, um, which you know lasted for over 40 years and now arguably in different ways continues, um, you have millions of displaced people, you have people living in villages which, in which, of course, uh, armed opposition is, is present. They nonetheless need to go about their education. They have people gone missing in their families. Um, they have issues of displacement, um, and and these issues are not issues that are, de are dealt with in detail by international humanitarian law. And so in that sense, human rights law also comes to play a much bigger part. Walter Kelly already, I think, in the late 90s wrote very interesting stuff on, on displacement and IHL and human rights law, which I think is still important to read today. Um, I just want to uh, mention a couple of perhaps of examples where I think then we can um, really uh, also see the complementarity of human rights and IHL and um, and the opportunities and risks that that can uh, that can pose. And so that leads me a bit to the opportunities and risks about this increasing overlap between IHL and human rights law. One of them is um, that I had, one of the risks that I see uh, and that uh, Marco already mentioned is a bit the unrealistic unreal expectations or overreach that human rights law might sometimes create in armed conflicts, perhaps when um, state fe states feel that under um, international law as a whole, they don't have certain obligations because they don't have them under international humanitarian law, but they are then imposed on them uh, by human rights law without taking into account that that's not realistic and that's not foreseen by international humanitarian law. And the risk of that overreach, I think, is that although in the immediate term, from the victim's perspective, it might be seen as a gain, I think it can lead to a backlash uh, in the long term and, and in the long term then actually lead to more of a regression because then human rights law starts being seen as something very threatening for states rather than something that is a complementary body of law that should be taken into account alongside uh, IHL when it is realistic. Um, the other, I think, risk or issue that exists is the 
fragmentation over time or the regionalization of human rights law. Now, in theory, both bodies of law, IHL and human rights law are, of course, universal. But I think because of um, the different regional regimes that exist on human rights law, so the inter-American regime, the European regime in particular, but also the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, has led to uh, jurisprudence in, in of these different uh, uh, of these different bodies and different understandings on what the human rights obligations are in these in these places, but also simply um, jurisprudence that isn't universally binding. And so we very often hear Australia or Canada or the United States saying, "Well, you know, we don't really care about the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. It's not binding on us." Understandably so, in a way. Um, and I think there is a slight risk there. And I think Dick didn't get into the into the um, detail of it. But of course, when you have multinational operations where then different states have different uh, obligations under these different uh, bodies of law, it creates risks. Um, I think they're manageable risks, but I think we have to be aware of them. And again, aware not to, in terms of the universality of IHL and its complement, and its complementation through human rights law of not getting to an overreach that starts not being acceptable anymore. To, um, to conclude, um, I just want to again emphasize that, you know, they are distinct bodies of law as I tried to just explain, but also they are complementary and they have to remain complementary, particularly in these prolonged non-international armed conflicts. And just two things I want to um, sort of mention one from an IHL side or point of view, one from a, um, a human rights point of view. One is the question of non-state armed groups. Traditionally, of course, human rights law only binds states and not non-state armed groups. Now, in prolonged conflicts, non-state armed groups sometimes um, exercise territorial, um, um, territorial uh, control. And again, People in that, in those controlled areas, have to go about their lives. Um, so there's a, you know, quite a bit of writing done saying, well, IHL is insufficient. You know, we need human rights law because uh, IHL doesn't uh, doesn't um, um, doesn't um, deal with those issues. And I think that's true to a certain extent, but not only. So again, I think we have to be careful about overreach. We IHL also sort of has. Um, has a certain realism, particularly an additional protocol too, about what's feasible uh, according to the capacities of the party to the conflict. And I think that's something useful when you have non-state armed groups uh, controlling territory to a uh, greater or lesser extent. Um, but on the other hand, I think there is a good argument to make there that, um, you know, whether it's a matter of law or more, more de facto, um, one has to have a dialogue also with non-state armed groups about respect for human rights of the people who live under their control over a certain period of time, so for instance, of eastern Ukraine, you know, where, where it's quite clear that the, that the state cannot guarantee all the rights of, of the people living in that territory. And the other example I wanted to mention is the example of persons with disabilities, which I find quite interesting because, of course, you know, there are about 10% of the population at any time that um, um, are estimated to be uh, living with disabilities. Um, now, international humanitarian law has uh, often been criticized by the human rights community as having a very health-centered um, approach to disabilities because it sort of has old-fashioned language talking about, you know, the infirm and the wounded and sick, etc. And yet, I think when we look at it, um, it was still a body of law that had a lot of foresight in making clear that persons with disabilities have specific needs uh, that need to be addressed. Um, and if we have a modern interpretation of international humanitarian law that goes beyond this perhaps slightly old fashioned uh, uh, wording, I think we find a lot of things that, uh, a lot of obligations in. Uh, the Geneva Conventions and and, um, and protocols and Common Article Three um, that uh, um, require not only respect for the rights of people with disabilities but also positive uh, obligations of states to cater 
for particular access of rights to disabilities, for listening to their needs, um, and for particularly giving them access to certain services, humanitarian services, etc. There's also specific rules on persons with disabilities in detention and so on. And I think there's a real complementarity there um, with um, the Treaty on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which has a particular uh, rule, I think it's Article, um, I can't remember the, the, the number actually, uh, about its applicability in emergency situations. And I think when we take those two together, we can re see a real complementarity and I see very little need for, you know, discussions of conflict of norms or lex specialis, uh, but much more space for um, systemic integration, as, as Marco was, was talking about. Um, so I think wherever we can, we should try to look for that systemic, in, systemic integration and where we have to make a determination on conflict of norms. We can't get around that and we have to do that too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cardula, for your, uh, for your opinion uh, and for your view on the problem of the interrelation between IHL and human rights law. And of course, uh, uh, of course the human rights law rules are uh, applied in the situation of armed conflict. And of course, the people must have the opportunity to protect their rights, uh, which may be violated in the situation of armed conflict, uh, sick to the um, international humanitarian borders. But uh, we understand that now there is no division between uh, law of peace and law of war. and. If, uh, and if the situation qualified as a situation of international armed conflict or non-international armed conflict, the international humanitarian law play a principal role, uh, principal role in this situation. And all norms of international humanitarian law must uh, not uh, simply take into account, but uh, must apply effectively and comprehensively, in my opinion. Thank you very much, Cordula, and I'm sure that our audience does have questions, but it's high time we make a break, and we will resume our work in 15 minutes, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. <laughs>